Now, months of unrest in Hong Kong erupted into violence at the city's airport in the last week as police clashed with pro-democracy protesters. They're unhappy with what they see as an erosion of the freedoms they were promised in 1997 when mainland China took over what had been a British colony. Sir Malcolm Rifkind was the former Foreign Secretary uh, responsible for those final stages of those handover negotiations and he joins me now from central London. Uh, a, a very good morning to you. Look, in terms of the, of the Sino-British declaration that you helped broker, what do you make of, of what we're seeing now and what Britain's role should be? Well, it's 22 years since uh, the handover took place. And, of course, Hong Kong remains, as it was intended to, extremely different from the rest of China. It has the rule of law, it has free speech, uh, they have access to the Internet, people can travel and live their lives in a relatively normal way. So, in that sense, the agreement with China has held. But what the Chinese have been seeking to do is gradually erode these freedoms, and the huge controversy over the extradition bill was the latest example of that. So, I have the tremendous admiration uh, for... The, it was literally up to two million Hong Kong people who came out onto the streets and forced the Chinese government to back down. Uh, that was a few weeks ago. What's happening now is much more disturbing. Um, in, in terms of that extradition bill, we, it's, it's easy to understand why people weren't happy about it, but, but would that extradition bill, in your view, actually have, have, have broken the Sino-British relationship agreement? Yes, absolutely so. I mean, uh, one of the points that was being made by Carrie Lam, the chief executive, uh, was that the original agreement in 1997 uh, did not allow for extradition uh, to mainland China. Well, of course it didn't. That was quite deliberate and it was quite clear at the time. The reason being, and it's still valid, is that uh, China does not have the rule of law. It does not have independent courts. And if you allow people to be extradited from Hong Kong to China, they disappear into a Chinese equivalent of the Gulag. They have a, a, what's called a, a trial, but it's nothing remotely comparable to what is required to protect the interests of the accused. Clearly, these protests have become stronger, particularly over the last week or so, and more violent as a result of all of that. We're now at a point, aren't we, where we... It, one would imagine pretty close to seeing China wanting to intervene here. What impact would that actually have? Well, it would be disastrous for Hong Kong, but it would also be pretty disastrous for China uh, because uh, sending the People's Liberation Army or tens of thousands of uh, military into uh, Hong Kong uh, is infinitely more complicated than the terrible events at Tiananmen Square a long time ago. Tiananmen Square was a square, one single square, although very large, in the center of Beijing. It could be surrounded and gradually taken under Chinese control. Uh, Hong Kong is a, a, a territory of seven million people. It's like a, a small country. And therefore, although undoubtedly the Chinese could dominate and destroy the current autonomy of Hong Kong, they could control the place in the short term, it would, for all practical purposes, be like occupying a foreign country because there would be a lot of resistance, there would be a lot of civil disobedience, and that would continue for quite a long time. What then, in your view, should or could Britain do to help ease the tensions when we've been told, we heard from the Chinese ambassador to London and other Chinese ministers saying that there shouldn't be any, as they phrased it, foreign meddling in this. Is there any movement for Britain here? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the position of the United Kingdom is quite different to all other countries, including the United States. Uh, the whole basis of two systems in one country was a treaty signed by the British government and the Chinese government. Uh, that treaty has been deposited at the United Nations. We have a perfect right, if that treaty is being breached, uh, to make our concerns known in the most robust way uh, possible. Now, I'm not being unrealistic, of course. Uh, we cannot control events either in China or in Hong Kong. We don't have that kind of control uh, any longer. But the idea that we have no right uh, to comment when China appears to be in breach or contemplating a massive breach of a treaty which we were the co-signatory to, uh, the Chinese are on pretty rotten ground, as they well know, uh, if they make that kind of argument. But you, you dealt, obviously, directly with the Chinese 22 years ago, sorting all of this out. Are they a nation who are going to listen to any of those concerns? Well, they listen when it could affect their own interests. I mean, I think there is a balance here. I think the Chinese government were humiliated when they had to climb down over the extradition bill. 
Uh, but of course, what's happened since then uh, has involved many thousands of Hong Kong people, but not as many as uh, protested against the extradition bill, uh, taking the stage one stage further. Now, what I'd like to see happen may be unrealistic, but what the Chinese government ought to do is enter into a dialogue with the people of Hong Kong about how to respect more substantially the spirit and letter of the uh, two systems in one country uh, principle, which was, after all, a Chinese initiative uh, under Deng Xiaoping. Uh, because the alternative uh, is uh, the invasion. I mean, they're not going to simply allow this to continue indefinitely. But if they send in thousands of uh, Chinese troops or armed uh, police, uh, then all the problems I mentioned a few moments ago just begin to happen. It begins to get far worse. And, of course, it also makes the uh, overriding uh, interest of trying to persuade the people of Taiwan uh, which effectively at the moment is a separate country, but which they claim has to be seen as part of China. Uh, their whole argument to Taiwan is, why don't you follow Hong Kong, two systems in one country, you could keep your way of life, while again becoming part of China. Well, that's never been seen other than with huge skepticism in Taiwan. It would be for the birds completely, if it's not already, uh, if you send the uh, People's Liberation Army over the border into Hong Kong. Uh, Sir Malcolm, if I may, can I bring you a little bit closer to home and, and what we're looking at over the, over the coming weeks? Um, there's all this talk, there's been talk of a, of a national unity government, Jeremy Corbyn being a caretaker prime minister, or perhaps Kenneth Clark. Uh, that would all need a, a, a vote of no confidence to be passed in, in Boris Johnson, in, in effect. Do you think that that will happen? I think it might happen because it doesn't need uh, many uh, on the Conservative side uh, to either abstain. Uh, they don't have to vote against the government, they could abstain. But it only needs a small number and the government are defeated and it seems likely the numbers uh, are there. I think it's uh, important to be uh, quite specific about what the issue is. This is not a clash about Brexit as such. It is a clash about whether the government, unable to persuade Parliament, and unwilling to have a general election before October the 31st, uh, are allowed to simply have their way in a parliamentary democracy. Now, Brexit was all about uh, bringing power back to our parliament. And it's perfectly legitimate for Boris Johnson to say, I think no deal is in the public interest. That's the, the government's judgment. They have to persuade members of parliament. If they can't persuade them, then there is a logjam. How do you resolve that logjam if you're a parliamentary democracy? You appeal ultimately to the electorate through a general election. You can't have that election after the date uh, that you're leaving the EU. You have that election uh, a week, uh, 10 days, whatever it is, before that date. So either the government is returned, in which case it has a mandate for the people for no deal, which I'm sure MPs would respect, uh, or if the alternative is the case, well, then the public have spoken. I mean, there is an argument to say, isn't there, that, that that legislation, primary legislation, has already been passed by the Commons to say we are leaving on October the 31st and, and anything else is just seen uh, as a delaying tactic. Uh, well, it's not a delaying tactic. It is a question of judgment as to whether no deal is so painful, so damaging to the British economy, to British jobs and British prosperity. And I'm not offering a view on that at the moment. That's not what you're asking me about. But there are, you know, there are huge numbers of people, not just MPs, who believe it will be hugely damaging. Now, some of these people don't want Brexit at all. There are many others, like myself, uh, who accept the need for Brexit, but say, look, uh, it has to be with a deal, uh, not with uh, some all the uh, hard borders involved uh, in, 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 in uh, uh, leaving without one. And remember, if you've been part of an organization like the EU for 43 years, that's almost half a century. And as a result of the internal market, you've had completely free movement of your exports, your imports, the same health regulations, uh, no customs required, over half a century. You can't just leave all that literally in 24 hours and not expect major disruption. Now, if there was no choice, uh, then there's no choice. Uh, but there is a yet, choice, and, and that's having I mean, a deal. For, 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 forgive me, Sir Malcolm, but I mean, you, you've been part of, of very high-level negotiations. Yes. If, you, if you rule out no deal, as people are trying to do, doesn't that just simply weaken the negotiating hand? No, I, I don't really... I don't, I don't accept that. I mean, the EU does not suffer as much uh, from no deal 
uh, remotely as, uh, as we do, except for the Republic of Ireland. The Republic of Ireland will suffer as much as the United Kingdom if there is no deal. Every other country, their trade with the UK is important, but it's, remember there's 27 countries in the EU, and the trade we do, almost half our exports that go to the European Union, go to 27 different countries. Many of these have relatively few exports to the United Kingdom. Those that do have, and there is a surplus in trade, uh, will suffer, but not remotely as uh, significantly. Uh, it's not half their total trade. It's a far smaller percentage. So they've already made clear, they've done a deal with Theresa May's government. The deal was, it didn't take three weeks to negotiate, it took two years. Uh, so uh, if, if I'm wrong, if they are prepared to make concessions, I will say hallelujah, the, the, the saints be praised. Uh, but, you know, the, all the evidence at the moment uh, is that that is not remotely likely, as I suspect the Prime Minister will find when he meets Mr Macron and um, uh, Chancellor Merkel. Sir Malcolm Rifkind, appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you.